Good afternoon, everyone. This is Cynthia Talbert. I'm your host and welcome to The Awakening. This afternoon, we have an author with us. We have someone who's very accomplished. His name is Mr. Mike Mason. He has been writing books and short stories, both fiction and nonfiction for over three decades. He has been married to the same woman for about almost four decades. I think he's at about 39 years now. Their marriage is about 39 years. And they have one daughter. Her name is Heather and she too is married. He was born and raised in Canada and that is where they currently reside. Um, he also blogs, I'm told. And you are in for a really big treat this afternoon. So we say to our guest, Mr. Mason, Welcome to The Awakening. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. How are you this afternoon? I'm uh, very well. Yeah, I'm... Uh, uh, it just so happens I'm between writing projects right now. So uh -huh. uh, I'm... which is unusual. I, I usually have one book on the go and several others in production. And uh, now I'm just uh, taking some time off to uh, think about the last project, which was a long novel, and, uh, and ease into the summer holidays. Oh, wonderful. Yes, we do have a holiday coming up, and I know I can, I'm looking forward to being able to relax and just enjoy that as well. Um, I just want to tell you this. Uh, I read your book. We're here this afternoon concerning one of your books, and it's called The Mystery of marriage as iron sharpens iron. And I want you to know, I have never in my entire life read any book about marriage like that. Um, I've heard people say, you know, some women complain about their husbands and some men complain about their wives. I've heard, you know, different preachers talk about how marriage is meant by God to be this or that, or um, the institution should be this way but I'll be honest with you. Um, I have never, ever read anything like that about marriage. Um, in terms, I was just right a few sentences into the prologue. I was shocked. I was stunned. I was amazed. I was in awe. I was thrilled. I was intrigued. I was maybe a little afraid. <laughs> I don't know. But I was most definitely awakened uh, because it, it's interesting. You seem to be, I believe you were an accomplished or a, I guess we should call it more like a bachelor. You were definitely a bachelor and you um, were not looking to marry and you, you kind of had this life that was organized and, and set a certain way. And you don't seem to be the type to me that who would just like lay himself bare and open but you've done it in this book with the help of God and you really just tell your true thoughts and feelings. And then you go into the word of God and you use scriptures that we've heard most of our lives, but you, you, God used you to take it to a deeper level in comparing it to marriage. And so it's, I, I'll be honest with you, I was just made amazed, I was shocked. And I, I know that anyone who reads this book they're going to probably have the same experience because you just don't hear people talking openly and honestly about it from this perspective. And especially going back to the beginning and, and, and articulating God, what God had ordained. And so we're going to begin and talk to you um, and ask you a number of questions this afternoon. And the first one is going to be, what made you uh, decide to even write this book on marriage? Well, I wrote it because I had to. Uh, I needed a book like that. And this has actually been true of all my books that uh, I write the book that uh, I need to read, but it doesn't exist, or at least I can't find it. And at the time I, uh, I was a hard-bitten bachelor. I'd, uh, I'd had romances, but they'd all failed. And I decided I was just done with that. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, was, uh, 
I was very happy being sing single. You know, I'd worked through a lot of personal stuff at, to a point where I was happy and at peace with my life. And it was at that point that I, I fell in love. Hmm. Again, you know, uh, but this time it was, uh, it was really deep and the real thing. And in fact, uh, here I was this, uh, I, I was even, I was considering going into a monastery. I, I really became a Christian through reading Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk. And what drew me to him was what a fabulous writer he is, but also uh, the depth of his, his faith. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll be a monk. And it just so happened there was a, a Trappist monastery nearby, so I had visited there a few times. And in that state of mind, I, I met this woman and fell in love. And it completely threw me for a loop. In fact, the, the first time I, uh, I asked her out for a date and uh, feeling quite conflicted about the whole thing, but when she said yes on the phone, after I hung up, I fell on my knees and I thanked God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was, that was really how out of touch I was with my, my own deep desire to be married. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even, I didn't see it coming. I, I thought I was, I thought I was going to be a happy, uh, either a, a bachelor or maybe a monk for the rest of my life. But love happened to me. And after that, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing because it, this conflict between the desire to be single and to be married continued in my heart. And I had to work that out in writing. I had to, um, I had to develop a theology of marriage. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Paul in, in the New Testament, uh, when you read his advice about marriage, you, you end up with the feeling that, well, maybe it's not a good idea. And so I had to, I had to figure out why, why is this a good idea? And I think I really connected with, with God's heart for marriage and, and why he loves this and why he has ordained it as I believe one of the sacraments. And uh, so I actually wrote a, a large part of the book before we were married, during the year of our engagement leading up to the wedding. I wrote, I kept a diary of all my, all my thoughts, all my conflicts, uh, my emotions, but especially what I felt God was telling me about the, uh, the beauty of marriage. And so I was preparing myself to, uh, to enter into this. And once we were married, we, we spent the first year studying uh, at a theological college together. And then uh, then we moved to a small town in British Columbia, and I set up my typewriter. It, it was a typewriter in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was in a little room in a large summer house that was very cold uh, because it was winter. And uh, I had three sources of, of heat, the, uh, a little propane heater, and a heating pad for my feet. And uh, what was the other one? I don't remember. Um, but rattling away on the typewriter, I, I took the notes that I'd made during uh, the time of our engagement and I turned them into this book on marriage. And I still think that 
it was it certainly wasn't any wisdom of my own or that came out of experience of being married i believe it was uh, a message from the lord for me and obviously from the reception of the book over the years for for many others uh, of his plan and his thinking about marriage and it was kind of a blueprint of not anything that I knew or any wisdom I had at the time, but a blueprint for the what I would have to walk out in the years to come in order to be in order to be well married. And I uh, yeah, that's that's how it happened. Wow, and, and I think I totally have to agree with you that it, it seems to me when I read it as if God really revealed to you, his heart and mind concerning marriage and the original intent and purpose. And it's just amazing in, in the way that he used you to just be open and honest and just naked and, and to just uh, reveal that. And so it's here for us today. Now the title, why did you entitle the book, The Mystery of Marriage as Iron Sharpens Iron? Well, I'll just say something more about what we were talking about. Um, I believe that happens to us many times uh, where God tells us things that we don't know. Uh, he gives us wisdom that uh, we have to live out. And so it's, it's, not, it's not things that we've yet incorporated, but uh, this is where we're going in our lives. So the title, uh, my original, my title for the book was As Iron Sharpens Iron, which is a verse from Proverbs, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And I feel that's a, uh, a picture of what happens in marriage. The two, okay. the two partners sharpen each other in the sense of growing together in love and in maturity and in godliness. And, you know, the sharpening process is, uh, well, we have, a, uh, we have a, a steel that we sharpen our knives on and uh, you go back and forth like this and there are sparks. <laughs> and, there are certainly sparks in marriage. They can be sparks of attraction. They can be sparks of uh, anger and other emotions at times. But it's that, you know, um, rubbing up against each other and, and having to be uh, matured and purified that is the heart of marriage. It was the publisher who added the, who preferred the, uh, the title of the mystery of marriage and uh i think it, i think it's a good one uh because it is a mystery and the more we're able to cultivate that sense of this uh this this partner we live with in these daily circumstances of you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, all the things that go on in a house just from day to day, the more we can cultivate the, the mystery of that, the, uh, the wonder of it, the more successfully we'll be married. Because you find, you find mystery and wonder in the most mundane and ordinary circumstances. I think that's where it thrives best. Uh, I was just lying in bed with my wife the other night before we went to sleep. And uh, I just thought all over again of the mystery of this person mm -hmm. named Karen. Uh, and, you know, all the, these 39 years we've been together. Yes, I, I've really gotten to know her. <clears throat> but there's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot that still is a mystery to me and uh, 
she's she belongs to God, and I have the privilege of uh, of getting to know her. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, uh, the next question. Your first chapter in your book is called Otherness. And in this chapter, you reference, you actually go back to the beginning of the Bible. You go back to the beginning of all things as we know them. Um, you reference Genesis 20, I'm sorry, 2, verse 23 and 24. And that's where God created Eve. Uh, and you discuss the way that he created her and Adam's response to her and how we all, you believe, secretly long to <laughs> perpetuate that one astounding moment in the Garden of Eden. Could you please discuss this concept with us? Well, I love the word otherness. I think it's a bit of an odd word and to describe an odd concept. Uh, I think our, the problems we run into in relating to other people are some form of projecting ourselves upon the other and either assuming that they're like us or wanting them to be like us or something like that. But to really encounter another person as being other, different. Uh, you know, God made this other person uh, absolutely unique. And there's something about that that expresses the nature of God himself. And that's what we carry as being made in the image of God. And I love thinking about that meeting between Adam and Eve <laughs> in the Garden of Eden and just how amazing it would have been. And, you know, here was this man who uh, thought he was alone and suddenly there's another person, uh, the same as himself in the image of God, but, uh, but also different. And <clears throat> I think as amazing as that was, I think we have the opportunity to experience something of that all over again in our own marriages. You know, in history, there are a number of these iconic meetings, uh, surprising meetings between people. There was, uh, uh, Stanley meeting David Livingston in Africa, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. You know, these two, <laughs> these two white men meeting in the heart of Africa at a time when there, no, there were no other white men in Africa. And so Stanley says, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume, you know, it's quite funny, but how astounding a meeting that was. And then there's the famous one uh, of Robinson Crusoe, again, thinking he was alone on the island and meeting another person uh, Friday. And so this is a, it's an iconic uh, experience in literature and in life to be surprised, amazed by just being in the presence of another person. And I, uh, I think Karen and I enjoy moments like that every day in our marriage. And uh, it's, um, it's what keeps us, uh, keeps us interested. Wow. In that same chapter on otherness, you also wrote that marriage, and I'm using your words here from your book, that marriage is one of God's most powerful secret weapons for the revolutionizing of the human heart 
and you reference Proverbs 27, 17, which states that iron sharpens iron. And then you refer back to the way God created a woman, back to Genesis. Could you please tell us how in your book you tie these two concepts together? To, uh, to grow and be changed which I think is something that we all want. Perhaps we uh, keep it, perhaps it, it's a desire that's unknown to ourselves or, or some part of it, but we all were, were made to grow just like, you know, the trees and the plants outside my window. Um, in order to do that as a person, I think the only way is to get close to another person. First of all, God himself, uh, but also people. That's why the first two commandments are love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. We have to get close to people. And the ultimate way for that to happen on earth in society is, is marriage. That is the closest you can get to another person. Uh, normally, I suppose there are, uh, there are certainly ways for single people as well. But just the radicalness of the, of the marriage uh, institution, if I can call it that, uh, it is so radical that uh, a man and a woman would choose to spend their whole lives together every, every day. Um, and it's, but it, it's the, the radicalness of it that, that makes it work. It's, it's God's way of uh, providing a way for us to be fully sanctified. Uh, day after day, uh, living with someone who is often going to rub us the wrong way, challenge our weaknesses, uh, challenge us to grow, uh, encourage us, love us. Uh, you know, there's no power greater than, uh, than to be loved just the way I am. There's nothing more free. And certainly that's true of the way God loves me. It's also true of the way Karen loves me. And I love her. And it's really just a beautiful, uh, radical, revolutionary way for, uh, and, and simple and uh, unobtrusive, you know, in, in this very complex world where People are running around trying to find all kinds of ways to uh, uh, to grow or to become at peace with themselves. And here is a simple, simple thing where of marriage where we can just just embrace loving each other day after day in very close quarters. That's beautiful. Um, in your next chapter on love, you actually wrote that love has to come from God and that to be married requires God and the sundering of marriage must come from God. And you reference Mark 10 verse nine, therefore what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Could you please explain why you have made these statements? Well, there are four fundamental forces in the universe. The strong force, the weak force, electromagnetism, and uh, gravity. And I just read the other day that they have, they think they've discovered a fifth one. Uh, which is <laughs> amazing when you think about it, that there would be 
yet another fundamental force that they're just uh, learning about. Uh, but you know, beyond the pale of physics and science, uh, there are other fundamental forces. And the, the greatest one is, is love. And love can only come from God. God is love. He's the source of it, just the way the sun in the sky is the source of light and heat. Uh, love comes from God. So if you fall in love, uh, you've been given a gift from God. He has ordained this. And uh, now, <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to confuse anybody who is who is not sure whether they're in love or not and is wondering about marriage. Um, yeah, you do have to determine for yourself if this is the real thing. But once you have, once you've identified the love that you have for someone else as, as this gift from God that you couldn't possibly have produced on your own, and, uh, and that you want to enter into. Uh, and then you, you do enter into it through getting married. Um, this, is, this is something, as Jesus says, that God has joined together and that no man or person can, can put asunder. And I think it's a good idea, <laughs> uh, not just a good idea, it's absolutely necessary when you enter into marriage to think of it as uh, permanent. This is something you're doing for life. Um, it's something that God has brought you into uh, the state of permanence permanent union with another person. And so it's a very, uh, it's a very serious thing to contemplate uh, breaking that apart through divorce. Now, I think there are uh, grounds for divorce in some cases. In your chapter on love, you, you go on and you state that the love between a husband and a wife is a participation in the love of God for the entire human race. How so? Well, God loves everybody. We can only love one person at a time, I think. Um, I don't think you can stand before uh, a group of people or a congregation, say, and, and really say, you know, I love all of you. That can be an, an emotional feeling that you have at the time, but, but really love requires uh, incarnated incarnation and and it's, it's with one person at a time. And marriage provides the, the best kind of uh, laboratory in which that one-to-one -one love can be uh, developed and matured. Because we're, we're with this person in all, all kinds of circumstances, you know, it's not with our friends, we choose, usually choose the circumstances. Uh, we're not, um, but but with with a marriage partner, <laughs> they're just there all the time. I, I have a a somewhat famous uh, metaphor in my book, at least famous because a lot of people have have uh, remarked on it, and that is that. Uh, Marriage is like having a, a, 
a, a big tree <laughs> growing right up in your living room and the whole house is built around it. And I, I've, see, I've actually seen houses where this is the case. They're, they're built around a, uh, a big tree trunk. And wherever you go in that house, you have to take that tree into account uh, or you're going to run smack into it. And that's, that's what this other person in a marriage is like. They're just there in a way that uh, people aren't usually there in our lives. That fully, that, uh, you know, that in your face. And so we think we like to see the face of God. We think we like, you know, for this mysterious, invisible God to reveal himself. Well, take a look at the person you live with. And you might, um, you might begin to see why that, that can't happen right now because we're not, we're not ready for it. We are in training, we're in practice for learning to see the face of God. And we do it through, through other people and especially through the person we're married to. Um, yeah, so, uh, so let, let's, let's treat this person as if we are living with God. Wow, it's amazing. Um, in your chapter on intimacy, you wrote that there is nothing like the cauterization of the ego that must take place in marriage. You discussed the humbling aspects of marriage. Could you please discuss this with us? When I went to Bethlehem, I went to the uh, Church of the Nativity. And the only door to that church is a very low door. You have to stoop to enter it. You can't stay upright. And uh, the reason for that small door is uh, that that church has experienced a lot of violence uh, through the centuries. And there was a time where they wanted to prevent uh, um, armed invaders on horseback from entering the church. And so they made the door <laughs> very small. And that's the door you have to go through to, uh, to be well married. It, it is by its very nature a humbling process. And we don't know what we're getting into when we get married. But part of it is, uh, is that along the way we are going to have to we are going to have to humble ourselves. I often think of the analogy of a, of a hot air balloon. And when in a hot air balloon, you, you start to lose altitude due to change in air pressure or wind or whatever, the thing to do is to throw out ballast so that you can rise and stay aloft. And <clears throat> When we enter a marriage, we have a lot of ballast, a lot of stuff that we don't even realize is weighing us down and is actually preventing us from, or inhibiting us from becoming more loving people and really becoming love ourselves. And marriage is just a great, opportunity to unload that ballast. And you'll know that you have ballast uh, whenever you uh, get into difficulties in your marriage. Whenever there's an argument or, uh, or you get into one of those chronic states where, uh, you know, there's a sense of alienation that goes on for some time. Well, you've got some ballast to let go of. 
you've got to let go of, well, quite often it's, it's you're wanting the other person to, uh, to be something they're not. Uh, you want them to change. And you think that if you sort of exert enough pressure or uh, give them the silent treatment or whatever, that uh, under duress, they will change. Well, usually it doesn't happen that way. People change <laughs> when you give them the space to change. Mm -hmm. And if I want you to change, I need to love you just as you are now. And in that freedom, you, you will very often decide to change in a way that will, uh, will please me. That's how it happens. Um, now, I can't remember if I got away from the question or... Uh... No, you're addressing the, the ego and the humbling oh. process. So, you know, you're, you're answering yeah. that correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, ideally, we, we, we want to... Uh, we want to reduce the ego to, uh, to nothing. And um, that doesn't mean that uh, I become a doormat. Uh, I, th I think uh, we probably need to talk about submission in this uh, dialogue. And uh, so let me wait till we get there. <laughs> okay. In this same chapter on intimacy, you reference Malachi 2.15, and you, it, that states, has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit, they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. How is this relevant to intimacy? I think intimacy is our is our greatest desire. We we're all essentially alone. Uh, the place where we experience problems in life is the place where we we feel we're we're isolated. We're thrown back on our own resources. And. The only way out of that is, uh, is connection with another person. Again, ultimately with, with God. But uh, what great comfort there is in finding another person who understands where we're at, who will listen, who will walk alongside us. And that requires becoming uh, vulnerable taking the things that are that torment us on the inside, keep us isolated, and exposing them to others. You know, you can read the word intimacy as into me see. Mm. And uh, I need to let others, especially my wife, see into me. Uh, in order to walk with me in the things that I find most difficult. And, uh, and the same with, with her. I, I, I want to see into her. And um, because marriage uh, In, in marriage, God actually takes two people and makes them one. They're, they're one flesh. And this is uh, this reality is dramatized in, in uh, the act of love making, where uh, there is a, a, a physical and a, a mystical feeling of oneness 
with the other person. And you're really, you're really in that act, you're trying to become one. And it's, it's, a, it's a picture of really what goes on in the whole of marriage. We're seeking to be one. We're, and, and so we're, uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking of a, a funny scene in a movie my wife and I saw where, uh, where two characters are standing together and they say, you know, we, we're so close, we, we, it's like we share one brain between us. And it's funny because they actually have two brains, but sometimes we act as if there's only one. Um, but uh, it's, it's part of the mystery that we are one flesh. And that's the case with the Church of Christ, too, that we're, we're one body. We are the body of Christ. And this is a this is a mystery we can't really grasp, but we can, we can we can we can live into it, and if we accept it as really the case, it will change the way we treat others. And uh, so marriage is is uh, is the highest instance, I think, of the body of Christ. The um, oneness between two people, which uh, represents and bodies forth uh, what we ultimately desire, which is oneness with God. Wow. That's awesome, that, that's amazing. Um, in your chapter on vows, you wrote that marriage is not a joining of two worlds, but an abandoning of two worlds in order that one new one might be formed. Please expound on this. You also state that vows are impossible promises. Please tell us why this is so. Okay, that's that's two questions. Yes. So, um, would you like to start with the first? Yeah, the first. Uh, of course, it it says in in right at the beginning in Genesis that uh, a man will uh, leave his parents and be united to his his wife, and so the the picture of uh, of abandoning. Uh, Read me that sentence again. Uh, uh, it's not a, a, a joining of two worlds, but okay, an not abandoning. A joining, yes, it's not an adjoining of two worlds, but an abandoning of two worlds in order that one, one new one might be formed. Yeah, and the obvious picture of this is uh, the man and the woman live in different houses, but they, when they get married, they move in together into the same house. Uh, they abandon their their former, uh, not just their house, but their the, the whole milieu in which they live, and a new family is joined, a new household, and it's a real abandonment in the sense that you have no idea how much you're going to have to let go in order to make this thing work. And it's not, uh, it's not, it's not who you really are that you ever abandon. You abandon who you are not in order to become more who you are. You know, true spirituality is simply becoming who you are. And none of us are quite there yet. We've maybe made various varying degrees of progress along that continuum, but uh, but we're not we're not quite who we are. And but we want to get there. 
And uh, in order to do that, we, there's stuff we have to let go of. All the, all the things that, that are not true to who we really are. And marriage gives the opportunity for that, uh, for that abandonment. And again, it's, it's whenever we run into difficulties with the other person, into rough places, that's, that's a place uh, we need to pay attention instead of focusing on the other person and wanting them to change. Uh, we need to see what I need to see what I, I need to do. It, it's an opportunity. Now, the other question about, uh, about vows. Being impossible to keep. Yeah, uh, when you think of it, standing up in your wedding and promising to love this person for, uh, for the rest of your life, till death do you part, and in uh, sickness or health, riches or poverty, you, you can't really make that prom a promise. You, you don't know yourself well enough to know, uh, to know you can do that. Just like uh, I don't know myself well enough to know, you know, if I were thrown into prison and tortured, would I be able to uh, hold on to my faith? Would I be able to hold on to my sanity? Uh, you don't know until you put in extreme an extreme situation what you're capable of. So you can't promise. But what the vows are is God promising on our behalf. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> you don't keep a vow. The vow keeps you. I think it's the same with the commandments. We don't keep the commandments. The commandments, the law is there to, uh, to keep us safe. You know, uh, I can't say that I've always saw uh, that I that I never covered, you know, the tenth commandment. <clears throat> but because it's there, do not covet. I catch myself when I am coveting, and I have the opportunity to to stop it. <clears throat> so it's in that sense that. The, the vows that we make in marriage, as we go along in life, uh, maybe particularly at the time of life that I'm at now, as, as I'm getting older and there's the whole possibility of what if one of us uh, gets sick, uh, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things can happen. I want to be. Uh, I want to be up for those challenges, and I know I can't do it in my in myself. But I entered into a vow, which is really God's promise that uh, yes, marriage is strong enough for that. It's strong enough to keep me in every situation. The love He's given me for Karen and hers for me. Is, uh, is the strongest thing in the world. There's nothing more powerful. And uh, it is up for every challenge. 